Hi, I'm Joanne Pratt, liver transplant nurse coordinator. Hi, I'm Delia kirgis -Boyva. I'm also a pre-liver transplant coordinator. Hi, I'm Marty Hopkins. I'm a liver transplant nurse coordinator at Massachusetts General Hospital, and we are here to tell you a little bit about our program, giving you a little bit of education about your multidisciplinary clinic liver transplant evaluation. Over about the next hour, you're going to hear a lot of information regarding your liver transplant evaluation, and that will include the liver where the location is. Most people know that by the time we've met you, what your treatment op options are, the different types of transplants that we offer for liver transplant versus DC donor versus live donor, how organs are selected and matched for patients, the evaluation process, the surgery itself, both the risk and the benefits, what's going to go on after surgery to include your medications that you're going to be taking lifelong, things that we watch out for rejection and infection, and also your rights and responsibilities as a patient being evaluated for liver transplant. And we're going to talk about the liver and the functions that it does. The liver does over 500 different functions, way too many to discuss in this room right now. So we're going to uh, really focus on the different things that the liver does that make up the MELD score, the Model of End Stage Liver Disease, MELD. That is the score system that helps us to understand how sick your liver is, and it also is the way when a person's MELD score gets higher, how livers are allocated from the person who has died to donate to the person who requires a liver transplant. So things that make up the MELD score are going to be the first thing is the total bilirubin. The liver has to make bile. When we eat anything that's fatty, it gets excreted, it goes down, it helps break the fat up. Bile is also excreted in our stool. It's actually what gives the stool the brown color. So if the bile isn't leaving the liver the way it should and doing the job that it should, people are going to notice that it builds up in their skin. It can get yellowy in color. Their eyes can get yellowy in color called jaundice. We can measure that test in a blood test called the total bilirubin. So what we'll find is if a person's bile isn't leaving the body the way it should, the bilirubin is going to be elevated. That's one of the tests that we use for the MELD score. The second test that we look at is a blood clotting tests. The liver has to be able to, when we get a uh, cut, has to make some uh, a protein called prothrombin that gets excreted into the bloodstream and it starts this whole cascade to help us clot. If the liver cannot do that, we'll see that in the test for the prothrombin that it's a little um, higher than it should be. It's taking longer to clot. The third test that we take a look at is looking at what the creatinine, because we know that if a person's liver isn't working very well, over time their kidneys can be affected. So we can measure how well their kidneys are doing looking at a blood test called the creatinine. What we'll find is that if a person is not, if their liver's not working very well, their creatinine starts to become higher. So that's the third blood test. The fourth blood test is actually looking at what the sodium count is in the person's bloodstream. If a person's liver is not very working very well and their kidneys are not working very well, they tend to have a very low sodium. So those four blood tests, sodium, creatinine, prothrombin, and bilirubin, make up um, a score between 6 and 40. We put those um, those levels into the computer and will give us a score between 6 and 40 telling us what the MELD score is. MELD score is actually telling us who's at risk higher than somebody else of dying from their liver disease over the next three months. That's the job of that score. The liver also does things such as removing toxins from our body. It's a big filter, so if the liver can remove these toxins, it um, ends up that we don't have any confusion. But when the liver cannot do that, the toxins build up in the bloodstream. Usually people will call it ammonia. They'll see that they're um, building that up and they'll become a little bit confused. People tend to need to be put on medicines to excrete that, um, the toxins if their liver's not working very well. And we'll go over that some more. This next picture is showing you a picture of a healthy liver. The liver should be soft. It looks like it has some rounded edges. It looks like there's two pieces to it, a left side and a right side. But in fact, the liver is one organ. It works whatever is going on in one side of the liver is going on in the other side of the liver. And that's a healthy liver. If a person developed a cancer in a healthy liver, the surgeons could take that out just doing a surgery. But this next slide is showing you a liver that a person has cirrhosis. The word cirrhosis just means hard and scarred. All the little black nubs that you can see on this picture, it's really liver cells that are trying to help themselves and fix themselves, but they no longer can do that, and they become scarred. It doesn't really tell us from what, but you can imagine a hard, scarred liver, if blood is trying to go through that liver to get cleaned, it's like putting a hose against a wall. The, the liver is hard, it's scarred, it's just not flexible, and that causes a lot of problems. People that have a hard, scarred, cirrhotic liver are at a higher risk to develop a primary liver cancer called hepatocellular carcinoma. So people with cirrhosis of the liver should be having an ultrasound 
and then a, uh, some sort of scanning MRI, a CAT scan of their liver every six months, and that's usually performed by your local gastroenterologist. People can have cirrhosis of the liver caused by lots of different diseases. I like to tell people the word hepatitis, anything HEPA, H-E-P-A is liver, and itis on the end means inflamed. So if you're told you have hepatitis, that just tells us you have an inflamed liver versus having cirrhosis, which is a hard, scarred liver. These different infections can be caused by either a virus, hepatitis A, B, or C, or the rest of the alphabet. Hepatitis A and B, people will be vaccinated for if they have not been already. Hepatitis C, there's not a vaccine for that, but if we meet people that have hepatitis C virus in their bloodstream and they still have the virus, we'd prefer that they don't get that treated before transplant because sometimes what can happen is if a person who dies and donates has a virus, hepatitis C, well, the person on the waiting list could be offered that that organ and then after the transplant we would treat the person with medication to eradicate the virus. People can have problems with their bile ducts, they're autoimmune, they can have developmental abnormalities, polycystic disease, both liver and kidney. Um, we see a lot of people that have disease caused by alcohol. If a person has that as part of their diagnosis they can really um, expect to be asked and actually you know as part of our program to be um, involved in relapse prevention counseling. Uh, people meet with the social worker and they'll give them more information for that. We're seeing a lot of people with fatty liver disease. We see people with cryptogenic, meaning they really, we just don't have the answer of what that disease, what caused their liver disease. And we also see people with a primary liver cancer called hepatocellular carcinoma. And we uh, can also see people that have a cancer of their bile ducts called cholangiocarcinoma. These are just si some of the signs and symptoms that people have not, people not everybody will have symptoms of their liver disease and not everybody will have all these symptoms, but some people can have them. I think the ones that we see primarily tend to be this confusion called encephalopathy. It is not brain damage and the real reason that you have that is just the liver cannot clean the blood, so it ends up that the toxins build up. People that have encephalopathy tend to be on a medication called lactulose. It makes the person stool and stool and stool to get rid of the toxins. Um, and they can also be on a drug called Zyfaxin, and that can help with the, the um, toxins to keep the load lo lower. People that, uh, the other symptom that we tend to see a lot of is people that have problems with fluid, and it tends to be the number one problem we see is ascites fluid. That's that collection of fluid in the belly. Um, the liver makes a protein called albumin, and sometimes the liver can't make enough of that, and albumin holds the fluid where it belongs, so when it's not making enough, the fluid can leach out. That can be a very difficult symptom people deal with from liver disease. Uh, this fluid can become infected. We watch out for that. Sometimes the person's put on medicines so that the diuretics so that they can pee off that fluid, but sometimes those don't work, so they end up needing to have paracentesis. The fluid can collect up under the lungs. It can be a real problem for people with liver disease. But those are the things that we would expect after liver transplant. Those symptoms should go away.